now and then we start with the uh, discussion uh, Christian Christiansen has asked already to speak and then everybody of you is uh, welcome for the uh, development of the discussion there was also a very interesting uh, uh, comment in the chat by Ulla Rayala and uh, uh, maybe we will follow also this path but now I give the speech to uh, Gianfranco Chiai and um, so I um, uh, I don't know if you can record the meeting. Simona, what would you do? Because this morning there were some uh, embargoed uh, presentations, so I guess it is not the but, case. Yeah, there are no more presentation apart from the presentation of uh, Gianfranco. Uh, the, 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 the meeting is broadcast in uh, Alteritas uh, uh, Facebook page, but it will be uploaded later in the YouTube channel. So it only, will only, only after only after the, the embargo is over. Only yeah, after the course, embargo is over. Only tomorrow. After. No, tomorrow. <laughs> no, I don't know. It's also Alisa was embargoed today. I don't know if anybody has problems. Uh, so please. from the, from Cosi, Cosimo told me the embargo is up to 8 p.m. today. But Alisa has to tell us. Yeah, because also, um, Sorry, Alicia. Unpublished, yeah, it's all unpublished data. I would prefer to not. I don't know if you could maybe also just cut out my okay. part of the talk. That would be a possibility. Okay, uh, uh, I, I think we have to, uh, um, uh, Simona. We have to 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 wait and look for the cutting away of the of the Alisa presentation. Okay. We have to 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 adjust the 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 the, the, the recording. Uh, if anybody has problems, please tell us. Thank you. Um, and uh, so now, please, Gianfranco, uh, you can close your presentation. Yes. Uh, that was very interesting yes. about the situation of Limnos. Yes, I do apologize for this uh, technical inconvenience, of course. Um, uh, no, uh, um, this is all about uh, material Limian culture. You see, we don't have any kind of evidence for of an Etruscan presence or um, of the existence of Etruscan community uh, in Lemnos, the archaic time. To uh, Lim Limnia, the Limian um, the material culture uh, is. Um, culture, it's a typical Greek Anatolian culture of this time. Um, what about the cultural memories of Lemnos? Fortunately, we have a lot of uh, literary uh, um, testimonies, literary traditions concerning Lemnos. But first of all, we have to emphasize that these traditions represent a view from outside. In other words, this tradition reflects the way how Greeks perceive uh, the Limnian culture and the Limnians. We can start with the Homeric tradition. According to Homer, uh, Ilias, the islands was ruled by Thoas, a descendant of the Argonaut hero, Jason. Lemnos is depicted, characterized as a kind of port of trade. A port of trade characterized by political neutrality toward the Trojan conflict. Phoenicians, according to Homer, trade in Lemnos. Furthermore, Homer mentioned another people living in Lemnos, namely the Scythians. The Scythians are considered by Greek traditions as a Thracian people, a Thracian population. Homer, the Scythians are told by Homer to be agriophonoi, like the Carians, similar to the Carians in Miletus. Actually, the archaeological evidence seems to confirm this Homeric tradition. This is because Limnos in archaic time, 87th century BC, was a flourishing, very rich commercial place and the seat of a mixed culture. 
but very important, we don't have any mention of Turanians in the literary tradition. In the Homeric time, um, a very important literary testimony telling of the arrival of the Turanians in Lemnos is El Hanikos of Lesbos. It's a very, very important text. I'm going to read the English translation of this text. The Lemnians, the Lemnians as Hellenicus tells in the foundation of Chios, were called Cynthias, Cynthia, this Thracian population. For this reason, the Pelasgian Tyrrhenians from Tenedos, this is the earliest, uh, probably the earliest mention of the Tyrrhenians from Tenedos, came to the Gulf of Melas and initially reached Lemnos. The island was inhabited by a Thracian population of a few men. They were a mixed population of Greeks. Again, gone is on the Mixellenes. Mixellenes is very important. The neighbors came, called them Sinkis, Sinkias, because some of them were artisans, craftsmen, and made weapons of war. The Pelagians, the Iranians lived with them when they arrived on the islands and left five ships there. Um, in text, in the text, actually, we don't we don't uh, find um, the name Tyrrhenians, but the name Tyrrhenians was reconstructed as subject of this sentence by Jacobi. De Simone and Michel Grass followed, uh, adopted uh, the interpretation of Jacobi. And I personally agree with this interpretation. Now, uh, the Greek traditions perceive uh, <coughs> uh, the Tyrrhenians as a people that came uh, to Lemnos at a later time. We don't have no archaeological evidence, any archaeological evidence, uh, I repeat this, of Etruscans nature in Lemnos, nor in the northern Aegean. Um, what I consider, I personally consider as a turning point in the real history of Linus um, is, the, is the year 511. In this time, Limnus was plundered and temporarily occupied by the Persian army. I am speaking in context of a temporary military occupation by the Persians because in 500, as Milciades attacked Lemnos in conquering the island, Milciades uh, fight for not against the Persians, but against the Tyrrhenians. And um, the reason why I personally consider this year yeah, important for the historical memory of Lemnos is first of all, because all um, the um, Tyrrhenian epigraphic evidence um, is dated in the, uh, <coughs> the, end, the end of the sixth century BC. And please, Pay also attention to the fact that the um, uh, Limnian still mention a uh, Ulaios, a Greek from Phocea, from, from this Greek city of Phocaea. Uh, okay, and Ulaios is not, as far as I know, an Etruscan name. Um, yes. Um, we have other literary tradition uh, testimonies mentioning uh, Tyrrhenian communities in the AJ, in, the, in this area, uh, namely in the area of Propontis and Chalcidic Peninsula. Unfortunately, 
We don't have any archipographic evidence supporting the existence of these communities in this geographic area. Um, anyway, all these communities were perceived and represented as related, as cognate uh, to the Tyrrhenians of Limnos. To see this, for example, mention also these communities. It's a picture. Um, anyway, the only one evidence attesting the existence of a Tyrrhenian language in Lemnos, uh, uh, actually uh, only the steel of Lemnos and the new um, uh, inscription found uh, in the the area of the theater or Hellenistic theater of Ephesus, published by De Simone in 20, uh, 2009. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you, Gianfranco. Thank you. I can see, but I know you are there. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you. This last, uh, this last uh, presentation opens more questions than it answers. Yes, yes. Any other uh, okay. presentation of this of the morning sessions? Thank you very much. And uh, Alessandro, I give you the, the well, floor. Uh, well, well, uh, if you close the, of the round table. Yes, if you if you close the screen, the, the presentation, uh, Gianfranco, so we can see each other. You have to stop the sharing. Uh, okay, stop. Okay, that's fine. So uh, um, I don't know if there is any really flash, flash, flash question because we go further for Gianfranco. Maybe we go straight to the discussion, general discussion. So please, Christian, take the sh show. Okay, thank you. Uh, this has been a wonderful, inspiring uh, day. Um, and some of it obviously is beyond my expertise. What I can provide here, which may be useful, is a look at the problems from the Bronze Age. Because I think we have to understand what happened before to understand uh, in the Bronze Age, uh, in order to understand uh, how, it, uh, how it changed. Uh, and I will also provide a parallel uh, uh, to the situation in its true area. Uh, so I make these two statements. Now if we look at the Bronze Age, the Italian peninsula, we, what we can see is that during the Bronze Age, the Italian peninsula is gradually becoming part of what you could call a Central European cultural coiny, the Central European uh, Bronze Age. Someone needs to close his microphone. Um, so. Um, it starts in the Middle Bronze Age, of course, uh, with Terramar, and where we have very strong, it's composed by influx, both from uh, the Alps, north of the Alps, and especially from Hungary, which blend with uh, local traditions. And after that, in the Late Bronze Age, gradually, all of the Italian peninsula that becomes integrated in what we could, uh, then call the Urnfield culture. So I would say that by 1000 BC in the final Bronze Age, and also here we have strong uh, Hungarian um, uh, connections, um, but also from Central Europe, large parts at least of Italy uh, is, is influenced and part of what you could call a, a European uh, cultural um, uh, situation. Now, uh, to understand um, uh, the transition from Villanova to Etruscan, uh, I think it can be useful also to look at the, uh, the transition to the Mycenaean culture in Greece because here we have, a, as I see it, a very similar situation. We have a local uh, st uh, strong culture uh, 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 before uh, the Mycenaean culture where we then see that um, high culture from the Minoans are coming in. Uh, craft people, traders and so on and they influence very strongly what becomes early Mycenaean culture. It becomes a hybrid culture between local and foreign. Uh, and um, of course, they adapt the alphabet, but not the language. And in genetic terms, we can also see that they, uh, as far as we know by now, that they retain 
their own genetic tradition, but they are maybe a little bit influenced from uh, the minor side, but not very much. So we have a strong cultural uh, uh, influence, uh, but not an, uh, not a language change or a, a major genetic change. But it reshapes and creates Mycenaean culture. This and what do the Manons do there? They are traders. They uh, from that moment on we see in uh, Manon culture the arrival of of copper from Lavion. It's all about metal and mining. And I think there's very much a similar situation in the uh, in Italy with Villanova. We have in the later part of the Villanova in the Villanova culture very. We see influences coming in from Asia Minor very clearly. And also, what were people doing there? I see them as traders, an elite segment that s start to reshape uh, the local culture. Uh, and obviously, they were also there for mining uh, iron ore. Uh, and uh, what, what you can see here as well, uh, as we have heard, is that genetically speaking, these people were still uh, belonging, most of them, to the Bronze Age Central European genetic stock, like the material culture, but now with a strong external influence that reshapes the whole culture and create a new elite culture. So these foreign elites come to dominate, but perhaps not the language, I don't know. But also we saw there were three genetic groups and one of them could eventually represent these foreigners coming in. So I think, I think there are clear similarities between the formation of Mycenaean and the formation of the Etruscan culture, both genetically and in terms of perhaps uh, material culture and in perhaps even in terms of, uh, of language. Language is not my, is not my uh, part of it, but um, I, will leave it, I will leave it here. Thank you, Christian. It was very clear and uh, uh, also Yes, inspiring for the discussion. I only want to remind what uh, Ula Rayala wrote in the, in the discussion so that we have all the elements together. Uh, she wrote basically that uh, uh, the, um, um, we were somehow proposing that maybe the language was already there, but the people could change. Well, I don't know if this is the case, but the, uh, all the uh, analysis accepted more or less the uh, ge uh, genealogical tree of the languages uh, proposed by Simona Marchesini and uh, Carlo Di Simone. And uh, uh, so they accepted that, that the uh, Retic, Retic language was representing something, let's say, older than the Etruscan as we see it in the written sources and as in the, in the epigraphies and in, in the um, documentation, and that possibly the Lemnian was younger. So in this case, uh, the provocation by Ula Rayala was, okay, maybe you are saying that the language was, was there, pre, um, let's say, pre-Indo-European um, uh, uh, European language, uh, but uh, the people could come maybe in small groups, in elite groups, as uh, Christian has said now, uh, afterwards, and also change the uh, general situation of the Etruscan society. But I don't know this. Uh, I was just putting some more stuff in the discussion, Christian. Maybe there is somebody who wants to uh, go on with the discussion in this uh, case, uh, or even to deny what Christian has said, or to uh, support some of the observations. Uh, Gerard Tomedi has raised the hand. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. Gerard. Simone, è possibile the on, on, on PowerPoint. Uh, Simone, I've been talking for a long you have, Inter to share, you have to share. Yeah, um, I would like to to, to speak Simona, about. Uh, can can you uh, can you can you give to Gerard the access? I cannot. Ma non ti senti? 
Simona non ti senti. I have, I have already ah. given the, the possibility to share. Uh -huh. Come si faccia? Uh, uh, this camera, share screen on the, the, on the, the green, ah. the green, the green with yeah. the arrow button on the. Then you choose the the slide, and then you press again share screen. Condividi schermo. This is in the bottom of the fenster of the. This is ganz unten, Gerard. You can see. Yeah. Drucken und dann, dann wirst du den Bildschirm teilen. Okay, okay es geht. Ah, da muss ich aber zuerst die PowerPoint laden, ne? Simone? Ja, du musst, du musst ja. dann zurückkommen, okay. Mhm. Warte, warte mal. Uh. The bells are ringing, Gerard. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We sit in front of the TV. Voi dire che, che um, certamente la, um, la etnia vetico, um, no, let's say speaking in, in English, yeah, thanks. Um, the vetic etnia uh, has a, a strong um, um, impulses from the south so of course it's uh, the culture of, of luco late bronze age luco culture is uh, uh, the core of of Rhetic, of Rhetic etne. of course so if we look at the, at the card when we uh, there are plotted some graveyards in late bronze age in uh, the area of the luco culture we only find a few graveyards, but in, uh, instead in uh, northern Tyrol, there are plenty of, of graveyards, but these are more or less uh, invaders of the maybe uh, proto-Celtic people, as uh, Lothar Sperber has uh, pointed out. But um, there's not a, such a strong division between two, uh, these two areas, because of the um, new people there, they have no, no connections with uh, the local culture. But uh, the um, um, autochthon people still have uh, strong uh, connections with the South. So if we look at the graveyards and if we plot some graves with uh, ceramic from the local culture, you see there is much more connection as we think before. If we also plot uh, ceramics from uh, settlements or from, from um, pyres, ritual pyres, it's much more. And if we plot also the, the access of uh, italic form. So it's much more there than you would uh, read out of the graves of these uh, Celtic new people in, in the inwardly. That's what I wanted to, 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 uh, to express there. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, so what is your opinion about the relation between the Southern Luco and this Northern Valley? Yeah, I think uh, the, the Luco culture is, uh, of course, uh, the birthplace of, of the Rhetic culture. And uh, indeed, in, meanwhile, there are, it has, exists some, some new um, analysis of, of strontium of uh, people in, in, in the Alpine era. And they show that not a few um, uh, people went to the north from the south. Anyway, 
which is very difficult to, to show up because if uh, foreigners stay long in this area and they uh, live there and then take up the, 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 the meals, the, the water and so on, uh, what, what, is, what they find there. So they, they assimilate much more to the uh, local uh, inhabitants. Okay, I understand. Uh, so we have opened another another part of the discussion that is the uh, continuity and the development of the uh, late Bronze Age, uh, uh, Trentino and uh, Südtirol um, cultural aspect of Laugen Malaun, Luco Meluno, and the uh, connections with the following also uh, Fritz and Sanzeno and uh, uh, Retic uh, sure. uh, language. So maybe somebody uh, has uh, other positions about the either the position by Christian and uh, the position by Gerard. Uh, uh, do you have? A, um, do you want to speak about this, or we can also uh, move to other um, situations? Maybe. Uh, uh, Alessandro, perhaps Massimo. Massimo Saracino has about raised Lauten, the hand. Uh, ceramics. Okay, Massimo. Yeah. Massimo, we can see you and we, we can hear uh, you. Yeah, yeah I would like, like, I would like to... The, you have to stop the presentation. There is the stop sharing uh, uh, somewhere. Uh, stop, uh, yeah. Okay. Then, then there will be also Wojciech Sova. Can you see it? Yeah. Can you uh, see yes. it? Yes, you're starting. Yeah, I would like to connect with, uh, with what Professor Christian says, said that some time to explain the past the present we have to look back into the past and that's why we i would like to complicate the discussion uh, connected to what uh, also Greta comedy said uh, and that uh, throughout the the fire of this morning of the first part of this morning i would like to emphasize uh, another perspective that uh, that it that is that of the technology of production <laughs> and circulation sorry i would like to start the Anyway, uh, <coughs> share share underneath with the button. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the circulation, the production and circulation of local types arrives during the final Bronze Age. It is a, a crucial moment for the pre-formation or formation of the ethnos. Uh, in fact, some artifacts uh, outside uh, the local area would uh, seem to indicate those areas that uh, were already frequented in, in the past, but implemented many centuries later. The aim of, the, of this project that uh, is uh, followed by me and uh, Lara Maritana of the uh, University of Padua would like to verify if uh, what uh, Majiti said, uh, wrote in the 1970s, finally is, uh, is uh, attainable. That is uh, some uh, free point, uh, main frame point of local production in the uh, Adige area between uh, Bolzano and Trento with the exchanges between sites in the same basin. A large presence uh, uh, in, the, in the free sites of the Inn Valley of ceramics from the Adige area from uh, between Bolzano and Trento and the local production in the Upper Rhine limited to the area. Uh, the re-examination re of various sites in northern Italy have in fact shown uh, uh, a recurrence in this type of pottery, even uh, at considerable distance from uh, the focus area, for example, in Lombardy and uh, a Fratesina di Fratta Polesi. Uh, first uh, analysis of uh, Fratesina showed that uh, the, the shirt of local typology can come from the Baric area while that one from uh, Castel de Pedena seems to uh, produce locally. Produce locally. With regard to uh, to this fit, to this part this part of the uh, of the project, uh, we would like to um, verify the, this uh, theory. Are the production uh, locally? Are they from uh, uh, other areas like that that one of Fatezina, or whether it are produced from uh, a uh, uh, formal models. 
uh, we are now concentrating uh, in studying uh, some some shirts from uh, Calcinato Ponte San Marco, uh, Molane in the Western Decini Mountains, Colognola e Colli, and uh, uh, also Verona City. Uh, in this later, in this, in this case, uh, a forthcoming paper together with uh, Paola Salzani and uh, uh, Nicoletta Martinelli has uh, reviewed the archaeological documentation for the city of Verona and uh, verified the presence of local typological elements in one shirt and maybe one, one more, uh, or some elements that we called look like like uh, those found also uh, in Parona and the Montidon that are uh, all sites located close or near the Adja River. The, the final archaeometrical data are currently under processing and uh, uh, represented the next uh, IPP conference in Ferrara. But uh, we, we should have promised to surprise us and better verify whatever the track traced during the final Bronze Age by the local people was uh, in some way retraced but much later by the Rachel population whose archaeological documentation seems to be attested in the same sites where Luke pottery is present. That's my uh, point of view from a, an archaeological point of view from the Southern Alps. Uh, Vo Wojciech, would you mind if I um, let you wait one moment uh, just to bring more about no problem at all. this? Uh, okay, so no, no, uh, maybe no I know that Thomas Reitmeier maybe is leaving us, uh, and so if he has anything to say about the uh, Swiss area, Swiss area in uh, contact with the Laugen Melaun uh, aspect, if he wants to say something. Thomas, are you still there? Oh, uh, no, maybe he's not there. Oh, yes, he's there, but probably not. Not, uh, not present. And the last point is uh, Sarah Levy. Do you have anything to add uh, to, the, to the situation of the pottery about the uh, Laugen Melaun pottery going uh, around out of the um, proper Laugen area? Sarah, are you there? You have to activate your microphone, Sarah. I cannot hear you. Yes, sorry. Hi, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, no, I think that, mm, thank you, Massimo. Uh, explained very well the, I mean, what is, what is done and I'm looking forward to see the results uh, of, of the ongoing investigation. My opinion about that, it's, uh, I think we have to discuss more about how to use pottery to um, to say how, how people moved. Uh, Luco, that was a very interesting case study, one one of the first for Bronze Age in Northern Italy, uh, is very important to me because it's uh, it's a kind of uh, you know, how specialized is that pottery? So what what kind of people were producing this pottery? It's 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 a special um, shape. It's uh, it's decorated, it's handmade. So what was the social organization of production? Because uh, we, I, I'm, I'm more studying, I'm on a Bronze Age girl and, and Southern Italy, but we, we have two extreme examples for that in, 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 in my case studies. Uh, when we have very specialized pottery locally produced, like Italo Mycenaean, no one thinks that there was a real movement of population. It's only craftsmen. Uh, when we have uh, um, more domestic production, and uh, that's a recent case of the um, Neolian Island in the um, in the um, Capo Graziano of, of, of Stromboli, that's one of my projects, we have a mass of uh, non-local shape locally produced. And in this case, if the production is more domestic and so, and even uh, uh, women oriented, so it can be ex an exchange of medicine change, so a mass of movement of people that are moving and producing pottery. So Luca for me, and I'm interested to, to may maybe Massimo will say uh, in the future, what's how the social organization of this specific uh, 
shape or, 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 or were in general, and how this can be related to or linked to a possible um, uh, relevant uh, movement of people and not only linked to the pottery production per se. Thank you, Sara. Now I will go back to the uh, hand raised. I only wanted to remark one point that is that uh, what is impressive of the Luco distribution of the single pots and of the, the often in ritual situations, uh, both imported and locally produced, is that it uh, mm, predates uh, the future extension of the Retian uh, group. And this is very interesting. Anyway, uh, uh, Wojciech, uh, sorry for having uh, left you waiting. And so please uh, go on with the, your um, discussion. No problem at all. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I have uh, a comment on what uh, just uh, Christian said. Yeah, I think that uh, the Mycenaean model uh, is quite, uh, quite useful uh, to be uh, adopted if you are thinking about the Bronze Age uh, Italy as well. But on the other hand, it is um, it has some limitations. So it, it is not the same situation uh, because I'm linguist. So if we are judging the situation from a linguistic point of view, uh, and uh, we are dealing with the line RB uh, material, we can be quite sure what was the uh, original state and what was the, uh, let's say, a prehistoric uh, dialectal distribution, more or less uh, pointing to the Balkans somewhere uh, as the, let's say, uh, uh, proto uh, homeland of the let's say future Mycenaean dialect uh, and the problem with the ancient Italy is that we cannot actually point to such a proto homeland so the, the, the problem is that even if um, of course from the typological point of view uh, the some processes might be uh, related or might be the same. So acculturation or um, uh, coming into the contact with the existing uh, cultures and so on. We are not judging from the linguistic point of view so well equipped with the data as in the case of Mycenaean, and that's the problem, I think. But may, may I have a, just a just a short comment, yeah. avoiding yeah. a question here? I assumed that from a linguistic point of view, Italic or Proto-Italic would have to be present in Italy by the late Bronze Age, uh, and that corresponds to the expansion of the archaeology from Central Europe uh, into Italy from middle to late Bronze Age. Am I wrong about that? I don't know. That's that. that, that okay, that, maybe that, Goose and others will have the answer. Okay. That, you say that, no, but, but if you if you compare it to the to the uh, Greek Bronze Age, so the Mycenaean, we are much much more equipped with the data. And uh, in yes, I understand. Of Italy, we are not. That's the problem. I understand precisely, Wojciech. But I like the I like this comparison. That's, that's very nice, that's very interesting. I, I had another question and we wait for Christian. You said, and then we go on with the discussion, you said that the, um, probably the uh, Italic languages were already there at least since 1200 BCE. But what about the Etruscan language for you? Yeah, but I mean, that's, that's, I mean, if the Etruscan language is not coming from Anatolia, then where is then coming from, right? Is it uh, before? Is it if it's non-European? Then it must be Neolithic Copper Age, and how could that survive um, the whole genetic cultural influx from Central Europe during the Middle to Late Bronze Age? All over Europe, everyone becomes Indo-Europeanized. Uh, why? 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 Sh why shouldn't they in Italy? I mean, they. I don't know. Uh, this is not my field. Okay. Uh, I don't know if Wojciech has a very short response, but uh, Cosimo has an answer for Christian, somehow. 
Well, or a, a point. comment. I or a comment, an a comment, a comment. I wish I wish I had the answer. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I really really like the uh, I try to be brief. I, I really like the, the parallelism that Christian made also with the Menon uh, and my senior shift. Um, uh, however, in that case, um, uh, the previous studies reported around a 20% at least a shift uh, in the genetic profile uh, from some step population that arrived between my ne M Minona and my senior. Now, um, uh, uh, commenting the second, uh, the last comment from Christian, I, I also think that there are exceptions where step ancestry is present and uh, none in the European language are spoken, for example, the Basque. Uh, but maybe, of course, there is a different process. Uh, just, just to mention a few, uh, few uh, topics. But going to the topic of uh, uh, initial, um, what happened in the Bronze Age? That's actually a huge question because genetically, we do not have uh, almost no uh, samples from the Bronze Age. And um, uh, the earliest evidence of steppe ancestry in Italy, I'm sure some of you know, is uh, uh, in some individual from the Bell Beaker, uh, 2000 BC. Uh, but they are not, uh, this not homogenized, this, this component. It's still kind of heterogeneous. And in central Italy, we observed that at least by 1600 BC. So clearly, uh, there is a lot of, a lot of time between uh, this time, 1600, let's say at least, until when the Etruscan emerged. And so uh, it's without any doubt that there might be, and they probably they were, uh, contacts with. Uh, population from uh, allochthonous populations. We see also, uh, not in the, the data set that I presented, but in the data from Antonio et al, that one of the individuals uh, associated to proto Villanovian show a shift uh, slightly towards uh, 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 Anatolia. Uh, I'm sure that there is also some unpublished data that maybe Christian is hinting to, but of course, uh, we are just discussing about what is, is, is published or soon to be published. And so, uh, my, my, my comment here is uh, uh, what we try to do with our data set is actually to uh, use as a tracing die uh, this uh, Iranian Neolithic ancestry as uh, uh, an arrival of uh, population from the Anatolia. And we didn't see a shift uh, at least from 800 years until uh, uh, 1 BC. Of course, this doesn't mean that population like that might have arrived uh, before and might have uh, uh, contributed the cultural features, uh, but at least we do not see really like a different, uh, differentially genetic makeup uh, between uh, the Latins, for example, and uh, the, the Truscans. So um, just to sum up, uh, they might have been contact, but um, at least uh, not enough to, to uh, substantially shift uh, the gene pool. And this is something also that I think Alisa sees in the older uh, samples, but of course, uh, I cannot comment on her data. Thank you, Cosimo. Now, hey, Cosimo, but if I might just, if you said that that component of Iranian could be a rival from Anatolia. And when was the date of that? Yeah, so uh, as far as I understand the, the process that happens in Anatolia, and so, sorry, uh, which, uh, which sample are you referring to? A specific sample or in general? No, but in, in, your, in your presentation, you, you, you mentioned you had this. Oh, yeah. No, this is only 200 BC. 200 it's BC. 200 BC, not, very, not 700 no, BC. Not 700, no, no. no. But just, okay, just, okay. We okay. assume that uh, from Anatolia, at that late in time, also Iranian ancestry will come in. I, I know that Christian, you know very well this topic, uh, but just to clarify to everybody, yeah. at that time, Anatolia doesn't come pure, will come also with some Iranian ancestry. And that's kind of a yeah. crazy guy. Goose, Goose, it is your time now, sorry. Right, thank you. Yeah, there are so many things. I, well, to begin with, I should probably say that I don't think it's very strange that uh, Etruscans were able to maintain their language despite a strong step uh, gene flow. Uh, because that's, yeah, if you have a strong enough culture and you're populous enough, then you should, you should be able to absorb a substantial amount of uh, outsiders without actually having to abandon your language and culture. And as, as, as Co Cosimo al already said, uh, the same happened in the Basque countries. Uh, those are Basque speakers are uh, belong to the, uh, the people that have the highest amount of uh, male step haplogroups in, in Europe, I think. <laughs> so genetically, that they're really, really uh, step-like, but they actually don't speak a, uh, in European language. So 
uh, language simply uh, language and genes aren't the same and everybody knows that of course but um, in this particular case it's it's also a very good reminder I think that uh, it doesn't have to be um, and then I also think what Cosimo's study really shows beautifully is that uh, if Etruscans by the Iron Age start of the Iron Age already are uh, very homogenized, the steppe ancestry is, is very much homogenized among them. It basically means that they must have been there, uh, yeah, for many uh, generations before that. And that definitely seems to exclude a recent entry by the beginning of the uh, Iron Age. So genetically, that seems very unlikely. And the question that, that, that we're left with is, so is it still possible um, to have a, an Anatolian entry, maybe, yeah, around 1200 in the, in the late Bronze Age. Um, but having talked to Cosimo about this, uh, I guess there aren't any genetic indications from the period. Of course, there's a lack of uh, individuals. So I'm also wondering, I would like to ask the geneticist, <laughs> uh, can we still hope for some samples from the, the Bronze Age? Uh, and do you think that would change the picture? You know, Gus, uh, uh, I guess that the, there is always this problem of cre cremations in Italy, which is the really yeah. huge. Uh, like in the case of Alisa, that has this wonderful signal, mainly from the inhumations that late, slowly become dominant and also the only way to bury, but later yeah. on. But yeah. at the very beginning of the presence of the Eprasca, or the Villanovan, sorry, uh, component in Campania, well, the cremation is probably re uh, dedicated to the people which could have more connections with the, the Truria. So this is always a problem also in the Bronze yeah. Age. But I guess that with time we will yeah. arrive to the yeah. better samples. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, and one last addition. So we talked about Italic. Was it spoken in Italy uh, in the Bronze Age? Well, I, as, I think so, because when we look at uh, the yeah, Italic group, then most people would suggest or estimate that Proto-Italic was spoken uh, somewhere in the second millennium, probably around the middle of the second millennium or maybe slightly later, but definitely not the third millennium. When you go all the way back to the third millennium, then you are in the period where Celtic and Italic would have been very, very similar, maybe even the same language. Um, and so that would be a very different uh, periodization. But it's, so, of course, what is, what is really interesting is that Cosmos study also showed that the step ancestry that arrives in Italy and that uh, Saupa, the other study also showed, arrived in central it Italy by 1650 BC, uh, I think is, um, yeah, can be modeled as um, Central European Belvedere like. And that's really a pretty good, a really good match actually with the, the linguistic hypothesis of uh, Italo Celtic being spoken in somewhere in Central Europe. Okay, you put your hypothesis and now. Uh, Alessandro, Cosimo? sorry, uh, Enrico Benelli has to, to ask me uh, to, okay. to speak after Goose. Sorry. Yeah, for sorry, the... sorry, I didn't see the hand. Sorry, I was not able to raise the hand. So. Okay, <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> <able. laughs> uh, I, I feel a little uncomfortable in speaking about Etruscans or Italics or Italic language in the second millennium because anthropologists have always warned us that pots do not equal people and that it is uh, states that create peoples and not peoples that create states. So uh, I, it is uh, questionable if it's possible to speak of Etruscans in the early Iron Age, before the early Iron Age, I think. A thing uh, like Etruscans did not exist. Of course, people speaking Exactly. Their language, or at least the ancestor of their language, did exist, of course, but they were not Etruscans in the cultural sense of this word. So I would add a couple of epigraphic uh, remarks. The first about Etruscan and the second about Lemnian. So about Etruscan, uh, the Etruscan language, when it 
appears in epigraphical documentation, so about 700 BC, uh, it appears with a number of personal names of anthroponyms. A mm, substantial number of these names are not Etruscan. Uh, this means that in the at least in the upper classes of the Etruscan society, because the names belong to people uh, coming from these upper classes, of course, they were the only uh, people who could employ writing. Uh, these, uh, the upper classes of the Etruscan world included a number of people who wrote in Etruscan, but who betrayed their origin through their name, their non-Etruscan origin through their names. And what is also interesting is that the Etruscan alphabet was formed to uh, write not just the Etruscan language, but all the languages of central Italy. So the first Etruscan alphabet has some redundancies in it, some graphemes which are not necessary for writing Etruscan, but which are understandable if we think they created an alphabet useful for writing Etruscan, Sabellic languages and Latin alike. And as a matter of fact, it was used to write all these languages. So the Etruscan upper classes in the 8th century BC, when the alphabet was created, uh, lived in a multilinguistic environment, at least in southern Etruria, where alphabet was probably uh, first introduced. The second remark about Lemnian, so there is a uh, some new evidence, which is uh, highly problematic. I refer to the inscriptions from Zone, which I think Wojciech knows very well. Uh, in Zone, in Thrace, have been found to about 250 in a non uh, in, uh, in, in an unknown language. And the alphabet employed is almost the same alphabet as in Lemnos. Unfortunately, these inscriptions are uh, very fragmentary, so it has been not possible to uh, segment them and to isolate uh, lexemes. So it is not possible to understand in which language they were uh, written. But the alphabet is extremely similar to that employed in Lemnos. And we are on the uh, Thracian mainland, so just in front of the North Aegean islands. This is also something that we uh, should take into account when dealing with uh, Lemnian, maybe. Thank you, Enrico. And um, I, I think that uh, maybe we follow the line. So, Ignazi, Javier, Diego. Hello, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as a linguist, I have some, uh, some comments uh, to formulate regarding some points that, uh, in my opinion, are, are, are very dangerous. The first one is uh, this uh, risk to uh, establish, establish a correspondence one-to-one -one between languages and, and genetics. And th I think this is very, very, very dangerous. And uh, this uh, remark by, by Benelli very, is, is very at point, but because uh, we have uh, Etruscan is not only Etruscan. We have uh, Italic elements of different uh, layers in, in Etruscan uh, documentation. The reasons for adopting a uh, uh, language and uh, writing uh, can be not exactly reflecting the situation, the, the sociolinguistic situation on the spot. Uh, it is possible that uh, only a determinate language is, is, uh, is attested, but uh, 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 other reasons. So this, uh, this correspondence between, between uh, language and, and genetics, I think it's, can, uh, can, we, we must be uh, very cautious uh, uh, when we establish uh, these, these connections. Uh, for instance, this Iranian element is linguistically not present in, in, in the, in the uh, to, my, to my knowledge, in these languages, for instance, but we have an Iranian element in, in the genetics of, of the populations uh, of populations in, in uh, the Mediterranean, but uh, this, uh, this element had no, has no uh, uh, linguistic reflect. And uh, another problem is the chronology, because uh, we, uh, as uh, linguists, we can, we can establish a uh, terminus uh, uh, Antequem uh, is the moment in which we have the, the attestation of these languages, but it is impossible to, to, to make uh, uh, chronologies, relative uh, or absolute chronologies, when the documentation, the documentation is not existent. And it is very uh, dangerous to, to, 
to say, for instance, that the difference between two uh, dialects uh, are reflecting a, a, a time span, a, a determinate time, a time span. The, the, the linguistic change is not regular in this sense. We cannot make a chronology of the of the uh, absolute chronology of the linguistic change. Uh, and in this case, I think that it is very, very dangerous to, to speak in terms of chronology when uh, the documentation uh, is not present. And another point is also, uh, I think that the, the, the most important fact in the last years in the, in the study of Etruscan and Rectic and, and Limnian is just the establishment of this uh, Tirsenic group. I think it is very important because it is uh, evidence, uh, the linguistic evidence is very interesting. Uh, in, the, in, in, this, uh, in this workshop, I think that it is also very clear that culturally we are dealing with very different cultures, and this is very interesting also in order to establish the, the, the connection between the different uh, languages. And uh, in this uh, case, I think that we have the problem of the uh, place of Etruscans or the Proto-Etruscans, but also we have now also the problem of the place or the, the, the space and time of, uh, of uh, Proto-Tircenic. Uh, proto this is a very interesting problem because uh, the question of Anatolia, this is the, the last point of my, my intervention, uh, is also important in this, in this, in this sense because uh, Lemnian is, is, is there. Uh, Lemnian is not Etruscan, it's a dialect very, very closely uh, related to Etruscan, but it is different from Etruscan. And uh, uh, we must, we, we need an explanation for all these three dialects, not only for Etruscan, as, as uh, some years ago, the problem was the origin of Etruscan, but in this case, we have the problem of these this, uh, three dialects and the uh, proto tircenic group. And the last question is the problem of Anatolia, because I think that uh, in this case, uh, we must be very, also very cautious, very careful with uh, bibliography about this thing. Uh, in my opinion, this is my opinion. I think that the uh, attempts to uh, establish a connection between Etruscan or Tirsenic and Anatolian language of uh, Indo-European Anatolian languages, because the, the question is that when I speak, uh, when we speak of, of uh, Anatolian origin of of uh, Etruscan in linguistic terms, we are speaking of the connection of uh, Etruscan and Tirsenic with the Indo-European Anatolian group. It is Hittite, Luvian, uh, Carian, Lycian, etc. This is very important because uh, some, uh, this is, there is a, conf a confusion between uh, geography and linguistics. And uh, it is possible that Etruscan uh, can uh, come from, from Anatolia, and this was the point uh, 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 remarked by, by, by Heinel, but, but uh, not necessarily this uh, implies that uh, the language was Anatolian in linguistic uh, sense, Anatolian in the sense of uh, Indo-European, Anatolian in the sense of a language uh, uh, closely related to Hittite, Luvian, etc. And uh, this is very important because uh, all the studies obviously uh, uh, that have uh, uh, attempted to connect uh, uh, Hittite with Anatolia linguistically are studies based on the in, uh, attempt to connect an, uh, Etruscan with these Anatolian languages, only with these Anatolian because we have, we have no other attestation of uh, Anatolian languages uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, um, after obviously we have, we 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 must uh, leave aside uh, Hattian or, or Harian because the connection with Etruscan is, is impossible in this moment. But it is clear that uh, it is possible that uh, Etruscan uh, or Tirsenic came from Anatolia, from the Aegean Anatolian uh, uh, space. But it not it is not uh, it is not necessary that a, a, a genetic uh, connection with uh, Indo-European Anatolian. And also it is possible a connection with Indo-European non-Anatolian in other, another context. And in this uh, sense, it's also important to remark that if this element, this genetic element of a step origin of, of Etruscan was uh, uh, linguistically relevant, we can speculate with other possibilities for, for the, the situation of, uh, of Anatolia. Anatolian is, in my opinion, not an Indo-European language, but uh, we can say some uh, Indo-European elements in, 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 in Anatolian. This was for instance, the, the opinion by uh, Marcelo Durante, the, the idea of a, a remote contact, contact of, or a remote connection of uh, uh, Etruscan with uh, Indo-European as a whole. And I think that it's possible to, to, to think of, of a, a similar origin. Uh, 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 also, it is possible that the step uh, 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 populations were speaking not only Indo-European languages, it's also a possibility. Eh? 
so this is a very interesting uh, thank question. You. Eh? But uh, thank okay, this is thank so. you very much, Ignazi uh, Javier. Any anyway, I guess that during this discussion we didn't uh, stick directly genetic and the uh, language. We were sometimes going closer to this, but we didn't do. We uh, also Christian said it is not my matter, and mm -hmm. I don't know when the language came in. And I don't know, so the, the positions are, are very different. And I want to know now what Wojciech has to say, maybe also in relation to what uh, Enrico brought in the discussion. Uh, story, I would like to sign myself for later because I, as an organizer, I cannot raise the hand. Okay, but so Simone, you are the next. I would uh, like to speak. You are, you are the next, uh, Simona, <laughs> I write it down. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Simona. Uh, I would like to combine both what uh, Enrico and uh, Ignati, uh, Ignatio uh, just said, uh, that um, what we are talking about is the, so to say, well-established map of languages or dialects of the people and et et etnian, etnia in the, uh, let's say, Bronze Age in Europe or South Europe. And what we are not taking into consideration are the various types of the fragmentary attested languages or the, let's say, the relic languages. And I think uh, that was the point Enrico just um, raised that we are not quite sure whether the evidence from Zone is actually Thracian at all. Uh, we don't know this. Uh, and. Uh, it probably is, but uh, what is this? Uh, uh, what is the relationship between this material and the, let's say, Lemnian, for example? Uh, because uh, the proximity of the islands um, is quite quite near. So the same situation would apply to the uh, to the Italy as well. So what we can map, of course, are the well known so to say languages, but we still do not know much about the, I don't know, Northern Pisanian, for example, and so on. So that's why it, it's difficult in pure linguistic terms, I mean, to, to just overlap uh, the archeological or the genetic map uh, with the cultures and, um, and to assume the the consequences which it brings for the um, for the linguistic situation or linguistic identity of the people. So I think I, I think the each of the present present uh, uh, hypothesis um, is valid uh, as much as uh, it gives us the possibility to to combine it with the uh, with the data not in, let's say putting aside uh, uh, one piece of the um, of the uh, of the entire uh, situation so for example if we are talking about the ling linguistics we can of course uh, assume that the archaeological data has something to say and vice versa and the problem, I, I think the problem is in today's humanities that uh, generally speaking, if we are talking about the archeological evidence, we tend to forget about the linguistic one and so on. And I think uh, especially this context of the, of the uh, smaller or forgotten or rel relic or fragmentary attested languages, whatever their stock may be, there are mostly of Indo-European stock probably in this area um, is valid and uh, worth um, worth studying in this particular context because because it could um, give us additional information about the spread of let's say proto tirsenian or whatever uh, whatever you call it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wojciech. And now Simona, and then if there is not uh, again some discussion about what Simona is saying, I will shift to more of the genetic side of the discussion because we had a lot of discussion about uh, some about the archaeology, uh, some about the linguistic, and then we have to shift also to the other arguments. But Simona, you are it's your, your time now. Yes, thank you. I would like uh, simply to, to focus some aspects that have merged 
during the, the, the morning and also in these last interventions. Uh, we, ha we have to remember that we are here to, to learn to, to ask the right questions. And one of the right questions is, how is a people defined? Uh, by what uh, elements, by what features? And we all know that the definition of a people is made of many different elements, factors. And the language is one, the material culture is another. Religion, we didn't speak about uh, religion, but also religion is um, an important element to define a community, if not an ethnos. And of course, uh, we are forced to follow some path. For example, the path of the languages like uh, Etruscan, Retian connection, because uh, at least starting with, uh, uh, with, with the history, starting with the, with the seventh century BC, these are concrete elements, concrete data. And uh, uh, what does this data uh, say? They say that there is, and I come back to what uh, Ignazi told, uh, there is a, chrono a relative chronology, uh, Ignazi. Uh, I mean, uh, the reason why I, I, I thought to, to, to make this, uh, and, and I, um, I asked my, my colleagues, Luca and Alessandro, to, to, to make uh, with me, to organize this meeting, was because I found some relative chronology between the Retian language and the Etruscan language. And these data are, in my view, relevant. And they're not only a question of uh, uh, relative chronology, of innovations. So Etruscan put some innovations that in, in comparison to Retian. But this comparison are influenced by uh, the, the, the proximity with the Italic languages. And so that's the questions. Why and when this proximity has led to these innovations? And I ask myself, is that uh, Etruscan Retian unity uh, are there in, in a, before the, uh, the, the, the Iron Age, before the Bronze Age? So this unity coming from whatever, from east, from northern, through east, through north, and so on. Uh, and then what happened? They have split into two, uh, two branches and uh, Etruscan has innovated. So that means that they found in Italy a population that al was already there. So the Italian, uh, Latin uh, Italic populations or through this long distance separation, lo long time separation, because we must remember that the lexicon is not, con not conserved. In my opinion, it, observing the linguistic data, the separation must have been taken in, in, in a long time before. Uh, so not only two or three hundred uh, years, but a longer distance, a deeper distance. And uh, where probably uh, the split was followed by the incoming of the uh, Indo-Europeans in Italy. That means Etruscan writing unity should be very ancient uh, Neolithic probably, and the, uh, the, 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 the coming for, of the, of the Indo-Europeans in Italy should have uh, happened later. And would this uh, coming of the Indo-European, these migrations also in small groups, uh, progressively, not an invasion, not a great mass of people, have caused the distance between the Retian and the Etruscans uh, that were the questions that a relative chronology impose, imposes. I mean, I was uh, arguing about the, these migrations of populations, uh, right? Because I observed this relative, uh, this relative chronology and these innovations influenced by the people's events in Italy. And it seems uh, also for what Cosimo said, 
from the rec genetic reconstruction that it is plausible to put uh, this uh, Etruscan Raetic unity some earlier, uh, a little bit earlier than the, uh, the, the, the introduction of the Indo-Europeans in Italy. And that could be a possibility of, of explanation, uh, not considering uh, the where, where did this, uh, this group come from? Another question, uh, just towards, is about the lexicon. I mean, the lexicon in the split of two languages is one of the most, uh, uh, it, it is easy to, to, lose, to lose the lexicon more than uh, morphological traits. And it is what I observed in uh, between Retian and Etruscan. There's no doubt that Etruscan and Retian belong to the same family. But I cannot find elements of the lexicon in Retian uh, similar to, to Etruscan or comparing with Etruscan, uh, just only in the in personal names uh, as roots deriving from the lexicon. And that means, in my opinion, that uh, the, this uh, time depth must be sensible, must be very important. So I would like to, to ask what uh, the, the, the colleague, what they think about this, uh, this, this lexicon. I hear that in many cases, Etruscan is compared with the uh, languages of the Anatolic uh, uh, region, uh, just comparing on the lexicon, but I think the lexicon is a very uh, fable uh, element to compare to languages. Please. Ignati, please. Yes, uh, very, very briefly. Uh, uh, I, I agree with you in the analysis of, of relative chronology. Uh, in my opinion, the problem is the projection in a, an absolute chronology. This is more problematic, but I, I think that your hypothesis is very, very, very reasonable. In the case of lexicon, I, I think that it is important to remark two, two things. Uh, first, uh, the fact that we have a very limited knowledge of uh, 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 of lexicon in Rithian. Rithian ha we have very few words with a clear or approximative meaning. And this is a, a first problem. Uh, uh, perhaps we have a gap very important and the vision is, is uh, perhaps a condition with uh, this enormous gap in the, in the lexicon, also in the case of Etruscan. And the second question is that perhaps the differences in the selection of the lexicon are just, just uh, that, uh, the selection, because uh, cultural differences, as, uh, as uh, Benelli has, has uh, commented, uh, between Etruscan and, Re and Retic, perhaps it's, uh, uh, are also, uh, they are also present in the use of lexicon. Perhaps the terminology is not exactly the same because the use of epigraphy is not exactly the same. Uh, and perhaps this is the explanation for this, uh, 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 this lack of a clear parallelism between uh, vocabulary in Etruscan and in, in, in rhetoric. Also, the, in case of personal names, we have two different uh, development of, of personal uh, onomasti of, of onomastics in, in, in uh, both languages. And I don't know if uh, really the, the differences in lexicon are exclusively uh, bound to a, a time span, a, a, a long uh, uh, separation uh, between the two dialects, perhaps it's a question of, of a cultural question or, or the like. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if there is anybody who wants still to discuss this aspect, but we can come back later. There was, there was a point by uh, Gus Cronen, there is this new paper by Saube et al. 2021, uh, which discussed the, the situation of the uh, uh, Copper to Bronze Age, uh, um, some new data, not so many, uh, bronze, uh, Copper to Bronze Age uh, Italy in terms of genetic uh, um, uh, elements and the components, and uh, uh, the step ancestry would arrive with the, let's say, Middle Bronze Age, 16, uh, uh, 50 uh, BCE. Uh, so I don't know if uh, Goose wants to comment on this, even he, if he is more a linguist than uh, uh, geneticist, or maybe Cosimo or Alisa may comment, or also Claudio Cavazzuti, who is online, and um, um, or anybody else. The, this this is anyway a point. But if I remember well, the paper by Sao Petal 
this is an arrival indeed of uh, some step uh, uh, ancestry, but not so uh, relevant in terms of uh, the, um, let's say, the, 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 the signal. Anyway, um, I don't know if you have, maybe Cosimo has this, something to say about this. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, Alexander, you summed it, up, uh, summed it up quite very well. I mean, uh, it's true, it's a uh, few samples published so far uh, from the Bronze Age in general, and uh, 1650 BC is the um, earliest arrival in central Italy. Of course, it might have arrived earlier. What the, rep what the authors report is a long, uh, a, like an increase of disasters through time. But again, it's a very limited number of samples. Uh, I wanted to point out something, a parallelism with Spain, where actually there was a much larger transect uh, with the, in the Bronze Age. And they saw that the steppe ancestry doesn't arrive as a wave and replaced uh, uh, right away. But there is a, at least a, a 500 years period of coexistence of people with and without steppe ancestry before this homogenization take place. And so this is an interesting aspect. I don't know if it's the geography that is you know, peninsula, and maybe also it, in Italy, they might have also uh, play a role. But again, um, we don't know what, if it's a prolonged period of admixture or not. And, uh, and if besides step ancestry, also some ancestry from somewhere else comes, but maybe does not stick into gene, in, to the gene pool. Thank you very much. And um, well, Alisa is connected now. We spoke uh, uh, shortly about the, uh, your um, data formally uh, in terms uh, of the uh, problem that uh, we all uh, often face uh, in terms of the quality of the sample because of the cremation uh, uh, impact in Italy. For instance, in Campania, we know very well that there is a tradition to distinguish between the uh, fossa culture, that is the, the culture of the uh, pit graves, and which were inhumations uh, and the cremations which were bound to the Villanovans. So uh, as an idea, so there is this problem that probably your sample is biased toward the uh, inhumations. Maybe the, the situation is not so different. I, I want to, to, to go a little farther on this. Uh, in cult cultural terms, uh, which are not genetic nor linguistic, uh, there is a well-known uh, unity in the uh, Tyrrhenian area during the final Bronze Age uh, cremation period, uh, be before we have uh, we start to have again uh, inhumations, uh, the, the mid Tyrrhenian area is somehow a cultural coiny, in in some words, and so these connections uh, across possibly different uh, uh, speaking uh, di different people speaking different languages or even across different areas is uh, somehow a, a strong point in the period that precedes. Uh, what you have been analyzing. And even uh, at the very end of this period, we have the Villanovan uh, 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 elements, uh, which uh, by some uh, authors like Peroni have been also interpreted as a migration, as a real colony from Tarquinia, for instance, in Ponte Cagnano. But obviously we have a lot of cremations. So there is a problem of bias maybe. What do you think? Um, well, I think even, um... At this point, um, with the kind of depth and, and resolution of the data we have, um, and what we see, for example, in central Italy and from Cosimo's study, um, we might not even be able to distinguish if we have a, um, a migration or not, because the genetic profile looks so similar across the Italian peninsula. Um, so we might as well have um, a, a direct migration from Etruria to Campania, but since um, all the individuals we sampled so far kind of show the same genetic ancestry, um, we can't distinguish if it's a local development or not. I, I, think, I think this is very interesting and I, I, I appreciated very much the, the, the results because I guess that uh, as also Christian has said, if we have a movement of people, the archaeological continuity in the final Bronze Age and the uh, early Iron Age doesn't allow us to see a mass movement. And the situation is so already, let's say, let, let, let me say mixed or already arranged that we have some step ancestry, we have something inside, but we cannot see exactly precisely the people. Maybe someone is moving, maybe. And this is always the problem because the, as uh, has already been remarked that the elite uh, 
is always able to find friends uh, in the other elites. And also because uh, uh, we know very well that elites can communicate at the social high level in many, many occasions. Anyway, uh, I don't know if Cosimo wanted to add something. No, no, I fully agree with Alisa. I would say even, even for later time period in the Roman Republic period, we, we, for example, when Etruria is annexed in the Roman Republic, we have the same issue. Is there people from, from South moving into, in, into Etruria? We don't know because, as Alisa said, they look very similar genetically. But Alessandra, I wanted to ask you uh, if you could uh, extend a little bit uh, about what you were saying about the final Bronze Age. And you said that uh, what you're discussing about uh, um, cultural, uh, cultural, cultural uh, heterogeneity in, uh, in the South of Italy, where, where, and which are your elements of... Uh... No, I, I, I was only saying that the final Bronze Age is very homogeneous all over Italy, more or less. And we spoke of proto Villanovan almost everywhere. And then we started saying, no, in Veneto it is Proto-Venetian, in Golaseca it is Proto-Golaseca. So there are small differences inside a wider homogeneity connected to the Urnfield concept, okay. as Christian has said. Okay. So it, after the, 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 the fall of the Mycenaean contact, we see this expansion of northern kind of contacts. So this is a real fact, but the point is how much it is, is it a movement of people and how much is it readable in terms of genetic profile. The other point that I wanted to remark is that the so-called uh, mid-Tyrrhenian uh, koine or uh, connection is uh, connected to metals. So to the, there are some similarities that have been uh, uh, highlighted also by uh, Anna Maria Sestieri and uh, Peroni and other people in metal uh, working uh, along the Tyrrhenian uh, coast. But I guess that Claudia Cavazzuti maybe has something to add uh, to these arguments. If Claudia is connected, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, can you see me? Yeah. I very much agree with you, Alessandro and, and um, Alice and Cosimo. I mean, uh, there is continuity uh, from the, at least I would say, uh, recent Bronze Age up to the early Iron Age. And uh, as you said, and as I, I saw in the isotopes, uh, in the Strontium isotopes from Fratesina, um, it is very likely that it's the elite component of the society which communicates in the various uh, regions. And, and if there is, um, let's say not a mass movement, but a more consistent movement of people, as also Christian said before, it is probably around, well, the Belbica and up to 2000, more or less from Central Europe. But later on, <clears throat> um, well, it's possible that, you know, as Cardarelli pointed out, there is this sort of terra mare diaspora during the, the 12th century BC down towards the south of the peninsula. It is also possible. Uh, I don't know if it is a mass movement or, or, or if it is like a more dispersed diaspora. Um, but yeah, I mean, the integration of the steppe ancestry is between Belbica and 2000, not only in the northern Italy, but possibly maybe Alisa can say something about that also in the south of Italy. And, um, and yeah, in the, in, in the following phases, it's more, you know, something more interconnectedness between different communities at the level of elite, especially, not only, of course, but especially. Thank you, Claudio. Uh, there was Christian again. Yeah, I just, I just want to add that I am in completely agreement here. And I think what we are saying here probably is that the migrations of the third millennium um, uh, are substantially different from what we see after 2000 BC when we're into the real Bronze Age, especially when we're in the middle Bronze Age, because in the third millennium, it is probably large groups of people, at least in, in, in temperate Europe, moving. And, uh, and, and, and they really do get rid of a lot of the uh, Neolithic population, especially Neolithic male lines disappear. So it, it, it happens, the process is different. Uh, once you are into the mature Bronze Age, you have what we can call uh, conquest, elite conquest. 
you can you have a very you have professional warriors you can go in you can you can take control of a region you don't need to kill all the males as you did in the third millennium uh, to to get rid of them uh, you simply make them your clients uh, they're valuable for you and you can control them because you have a, a completely different kind of society. Um, and that's why I think also that, that, that in, in the Mediterranean, in Italy, uh, there is a, a lot more of the local population, genetically speaking, that continues alongside with those who come in. It's it's a very different uh, it's a very different way of taking control in 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 the second millennium compared to the third millennium. And, and also, sorry, Alessandro, if I, I continue with Christian's um, remark, also the demog demography is very different. I mean, uh, demographically, uh, probably late third millennium, early second millennium is not so um, let's say so consistent from the uh, demographic so perspective. Yeah, yeah, you, have, you know, population tend to enlarge in the second part of the second millennium, you see, and also the reason. Oh, yes, and uh, between 2000 and 1500, European populations nearly double. So this is an important point again, but we are left then with the problem that, as we already say, that uh, languages are not uh, genetics and are not uh, archaeological cultures, so what do you think uh, again about the origin of this Tyrsenic uh, family? Because the, the big point that remains is if this Tyrsenic family was there together with the Italic family coming in. I don't even raise the, 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 the lid of the, of the pot if some, uh, let's say, Indo European is not necessarily connected with the steppes. Because this uh, has been for a long time a discussion, but the, now today we are not speaking any uh, any more about this. But so, what about this uh, Tyrsenic family and maybe also the Basque? Uh, so the non-Indo-European groups that even have a, a consistent part of step ancestry, but uh, as we have said, uh, it is not necessary that uh, if we have a, a genetic flow, a DNA flow, we change the language or we, ad uh, we can adopt also later on a different language by power relations of the elite maybe, but it seems not the case because the Ratians are in the Alps, are there since the 12th century BC at least, but probably even earlier, and uh, they are the oldest part of the Tyrsenic family if we accept the relative chronology. So what do you guess about this uh, different language? Nobody's answering. And I can see Ivo Heinel. Would ah, goose, goose. At, yeah. Christian, Christian the raised the, the no hand is uh, raised from before, Christian, I guess. Yeah, please. But, but Goose, Goose has raised the hand. And then Simona speak about uh, Heinel later. He's not here. No, oh, yeah, okay, but you know uh, many things. Yeah, I mean, uh... Let's say that if in Europe Italic speakers entered Italy with the steppe ancestry, right? And they would have been there at least uh, in the first half of the second millennium BC. So from that moment, they could have uh, started admixing with uh, local populations. Uh, and then if you go to the samples in the uh, current post uh, study, you see that Etruscans are all, they have already homogenized its step component. Then, you know, the picture that emerges from this is that the admixture took place yeah, basically in the second half of the second millennium BC. Uh, so, in that period, these languages could have coexisted and uh, people with step ancestry could have um, been integrated into local societies and the other way around. There is one point, I guess, Kugus, uh, and maybe somebody else can answer. We are always speaking, uh, we know that also in Sicily we receive uh, the step ancestry and we have this uh, the admixture, let's say, but uh, uh, we are not saying anything about the fact that, uh, as far as I remember, the genetic uh, data in the Mediterranean area are much less influenced by this step ancestry. So if we have 
had a total change of the Italic languages up to Southern Italy, down, down to South, Southern Italy, we should expect that formerly there was uh, uh, some uh, different kind of language in Southern Italy. The, this is a big problem because the, the impact of the step ancestry is much less. But anyway, yeah. probably yes. it is not necessary because all, people were already mixed somehow and could uh, have connections. But as I work in Calabria the, 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 and in Apulia, the, um, the, 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 the settlements uh, on the coast, uh, which can be obviously conquered uh, and the change of uh, also uh, uh, connections, uh, are very stable since the early Bronze Age, the end of the early Bronze Age for 1000 years. And this is very uh, yeah, uh, striking. I think it's a very good point, but I don't think it's actually a problem, to be honest, because yeah, their step ancestry does enter, but why would that? automatically have to mean that all languages are immediately you know destroyed uh, actually we know we just know that multiple non-european languages were spoken in the mediterranean all the time and by the start of the historical record so actually the when when you, when we actually really start losing all these non-european languages that's in the roman period right when latin becomes a lingua franca so the the the, re, the rewriting of the linguistic landscape happens actually quite yeah a lot later so i don't think it actually it's a problem that we see step ancestry entering uh, italy without having uh, yeah without <laughs> completely uh, deleting uh, the pre-existing linguistic landscape we see in european languages entering but we also see uh, other languages persisting I don't think it's okay. particularly problematic, to be honest. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Cosimo wanted to speak. Yeah, I'd like to add something on that. So I think we all agree that uh, gene and language do not need to go together. And so as we said that uh, in the current model, we propose that there is a, a, a genetic replacement with the step ancestry, but uh, language persistence. It could be also, uh, and Christian didn't say that, but of course it, it could be also the other way around that uh, some population from somewhere else arrived, not from the steppe, but from somewhere else, uh, brought um, uh, the Etruscan language or a proto-Etruscan language without a substantial shift in uh, ancestry. And uh, if this population came from the Anatolia, uh, for example, uh, this could be possible. There is a shift uh, linguistic, but continuity uh, genetically in terms of, in comparison to the other Italian populations. But I would like to bring, uh, and just for because we are uh, we have so many linguists here also to the relative chronology from Simona if this would be the case that would imply that there was a movement from Anatolia reaching uh, Italy bringing the Tirsenian languages then there would be an earlier split from the um, uh, Retian and then a second split between the Etruscan and the Lemnian with the Lemnian going back to the Aegeans. So it will require somehow two, let's say, movement to explain uh, a pattern that otherwise would reply would require one, only one movement. I'm just talking about parsimony, but I mean, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's good. You agree with me, Cosimo. <laughs> Gerard Tomei. <I> just... <laughs> that's a point. <laughs> maybe Gerard had raised the hand. Yes. I just wanted to say there's one problem with the uh, radical ling language in the, in the local area. We have um, a lots of inscriptions um, on devotions, but we don't have any uh, hint that uh, this language has left traces in the layer of the names of the, of the lang uh, landscape. So on the landscape, we have a, a plentitude of, of um, um, mm -hmm. as, as uh, Peter Anreiter has shown, um, they all uh, uh, derive from, from an Indo-European uh, language. This is one of the, the big problems. So I've posed the question many years ago, uh, if uh, this Raetic, uh, language uh, similar to the Etruscan uh, 
might have been used like a church Latin. So you, you think maybe also superimposed, but there was yeah. Simona, Simona, and then Wojciech. No, I wanted to say that, first of all, the problem was, uh, up to recent times, the right isolation of each word. And uh, if we didn't have a, a list of words, but only inscriptions with difficulty of word separation, it was difficult also to begin uh, with any possible comparison. In the recent years, the comparison with the Truscan has led to uh, a sensitive uh, progression on the reconstruction of the language. Uh, we had spoken about this with Ivo Heinel, and we had uh, the intention to experiment in this return, in this direction. I mean, uh, to try to recognize some of the uh, name um, local places, so the, the toponyms. Uh, it is difficult also because of the distance. I mean, it is clear that uh, the Retic language is re re in recession, uh, recessiva, in, in during the, the end of the first millennium BC. And uh, we can consider that in the second century BC, we have only a few inscriptions, probably two or three. And the most part of the inscriptions is dated back to sixth bis to the fourth century. So later, it is also difficult for the Ratians to, to, uh, to continue to, to write, to keep on writing and to keep on uh, clarifying it, expressing this high culture uh, of elites, of uh, exchange of, of dedications. But I think the, this way can, can uh, probably offer some new uh, hints from some new way opened uh, for, the, for the, you are right, this, this of the local names, so the, the toponyms is a very important thing. And I'm, I'm, I, I think we can just start to, to work on it. But you guess, right. uh, you guess, Simona, that there is something uh, retic more? that you didn't see so far? Uh, no, I think that uh, as far as I know, there are only side, the publication of the, of the Monumenta Lingua Retica in 2015, only a few inscriptions from the Alps in, in Bayern uh, have been, in Bavaria have been, so it's uh, rock inscriptions similar to uh, the other, uh, the, the Schneidio in, in, in inscriptions. And I mean, they are difficult to understand and written in uh, an alphabet that is the similarities with the Schneidioch ins inscriptions in Tyrol, in Northern Tyrol. So I think that uh, mean, at least from the Italian side, if something new uh, is, is, uh, appears, I, I should know it in, in, short, uh, in short time. I know that another inscription has, has been published in the book uh, uh, dedicated to, to, to Gerard. Uh, and I have uh, discussed the interpretation of these inscriptions and I have told to, to have seen the second form of the plural in Va. Uh, so that's in, in a publication uh, with the Siloge Epigraphica Barcinonensis. Um, but we don't have any so much more uh, stuff at this moment. So there is Wojciech Sova again, and then Elvira Migliario. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Simona, for this clarification. What I would like to add is that the um, actually the material uh, published by uh, by uh, um, Anreiter in his uh, in his book about the let's say pre-italic or pre-celtic in the european um, lay onomastic layer in the alps is quite uh, valid uh, if you want to uh, stratify the uh, toponymies uh, for example or onomastics in the uh, broader sense <clears throat> in that regions so i think uh, mm, that's what I uh, raised before, that we are uh, also talking about the uh, plenty of say, 
um, till uh, now unknown uh, languages or dialects of, let's say, clear Indo-European stock, but we, uh, but they they probably are not uh, uh, being taken as the Italic or a clear Celtic ones. So uh, that might uh, somehow. Uh, um, somehow um, allow us to make the, um, the inner um, chronology, um, to propose the inner chronology of the, um, of the Retic or Etruscan, if we are uh, thinking about the coming from the, let's say from outside or trying to put them into the uh, wider, uh, landscape, linguistic landscape there. So I would, uh, I would not dismiss it. I would uh, take it uh, as the additional evidence um, and to try to put it uh, to our use, uh, trying to explain the origins, linguistic origins of the languages in mention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Elvira. Wait just one second. Uh, I have a question anyway for you linguists uh, or, or one of you. So this lack of uh, evidence uh, the, uh, the going to the Indo-European terms, that, does it mean for you that there is a stratification and the Indo-European comes first uh, and the Retic came, comes second or vice versa or any case is possible? I don't know who is uh, who is asked to to answer. Uh, so probably who uh, would say something more about the let's say the dust dispersion of the languages and so on. But I would say uh, it does not really uh, have to combine with the archaeological data. No, no. So that's I was not saying the archaeological data. So I was I was only uh, saying if this case is typical of a situation where. You only have a ritual language coming in a region which is already speaking and defining things uh, through a different language or vice versa or it is impossible to say which comes first yeah i i would i would tend to use the platonic uh okay. answer i don't know okay so, uh, that's great uh, but uh, but maybe Hus or or simona uh, they will know better than myself thank you no so there is Elvira now. If no, Simona, you don't have the, the voice. Maybe you wanted to yes, say something. No, no, no. I have uh, Elvira and then Guido Borghi. Who want yes, to... Elvira and Guido Borghi. And yeah. then I will ask to somebody else who didn't speak so far. Just a short statement about uh, the inscription uh, question. Uh, when uh, Simona um, said something about uh, the epigraphic habit, which is fading um, at uh, second century BC. And uh, this is uh, an effect, uh, obviously, of the uh, Romanization and the coming up of Latin. But uh, very, it's very interesting after what you were saying that uh, in Trentino, the area which uh, has given the most of inscriptions is uh, Valle di Nona around San Zeno. So um, the impression you have is that where people were able to write in Retic, afterwards they did the same in Latin. So uh, I think it, it, it's, it's very important what you said about the name of places, because if you want to have a look at the inscriptions, at the Latin inscription from the Valle di Non, uh, you can find a lot of names which are absolutely exclusive of that area. You can't find the same names in other parts of the region. And the same it is for the name of places. Uh, all the villages, the today villages from which all the inscriptions came have nouns which are not uh, similar to other parts of the region. 
So that uh, uh, way uh, of researching about names that you mentioned before uh, could be uh, the real thing you have to do. Thank you. I have. Uh, I I fear that in in case as in the Retian uh, society is not an urban society, it's a pseudo proto urban society. We don't have great large town and cities such as in Etruria and in other regions, and therefore I think we face with micro toponymy. Yes. Not yeah. what real place names, which later probably were given by the Romans also. But you can't find Roman uh, toponymy in Valle di Non. Yes. 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 Thank so you. Guido Borghi, please. Thank you very much. You. Uh, first of all, uh, may I ask if, uh, since I noticed that everyone uh, very well understands Italian. If uh, anyone, does anyone mind if I speak in Italian? It would be better if you speak English because there are people who are not understanding Italian. Okay, I'm sorry, then, I'm really sorry. Then I um, beg your pardon for my primitive English. It doesn't seem so. It doesn't seem <laughs> at all, Guido. <laughs> Speaks better than many of us, yes. Mm. Uh, I also realize uh, nobody knows me, um, so may I in, uh, very briefly introduce myself and uh, my expertise, uh, if I may yes, say yes. so, yes. is a uh, place name research. So I would like to uh, search for an answer to Professor Vanzetti's uh, uh, Frage, uh, no, question, yes, question. Uh, question, yeah, thank you very much. Um, about place names in the Alpine region. Uh, I've studied um, hundreds of place names of pre Roman origins, and of course, uh, start, uh, I've studied uh, as well Professor Anreiter's uh, books about them. Uh, what uh, can one say about that layer? of names. First of all, they all have uh, an Indo-European etymology, a correct one. I um, underline that because it means that um, it may be uh, not the true origin, but in any case, it is correct. So nobody can uh, anymore say that, uh, for instance, a place name lacks completely lacks any Indo-European etymology. That's not true. There's an Indo-European, a correct Indo-European etymology for every pre-Roman place names in the Alpine region, be it, be it a Celtic region or a Rhetian one. Anyway, an Indo-European etymology is always possible. Second point, these Indo-European etymologies, of course, have an, uh, a diachronic phonology. And uh, these phonologies are mainly two, um, and precisely a Celtic diachronic, either a Celtic diachronic phonology or a Venetic diachronic phonology. Nothing more. Anreiter's um, Ostalpenglock uh, um, um, is a, uh, can be uh, rewritten in Celtic terms. The, there's only a slight difference about the treatment of sonants like uh, R and N, but uh, it, it can explain completely regularly explained away. And the second diachronic phonology is the Venetic one, uh, which has been studied by Dieter Schur. Uh, we can, uh, we may label it uh, Rhetian Venetic uh, layer. So, uh, Ostalpenglock is Celtic, is, but is it's Indo-European as well. What does it mean? Third point. All these place names show uh, the complete um, 
diachronic phonology from Indo-European to Celtic, either Celtic or Venetic, as place names as such. Uh, this means that uh, these place names were, uh, uh, had been coined as place names in, in, in Proto-Indo-European. Fourth point, what, uh, um, for instance, these exhibit um, the Neognos rule, which is a Proto-Indo-European rule, uh, a pre-Greek uh, Proto-Indo-European rule, and the Veta regel as, as well. So they were uh, Proto-Indo-European place names in the Alpine and Po region, Po plain. Fourth point, uh, I, I have been saying, fourth point is that um, Proto-Indo-Europeans, uh, no matter if they were of steppe ancestry or not, maybe earlier, uh, just to answer to uh, a previous question uh, of yours, uh, no matter if they were of steppe ancestry or Neolithic ancestry, Proto-Indo-European was spoken in the Alpine region and in the Po plain. Uh, fifth point, uh, river names in Etruria uh, are of Indo-European etymology. There isn't a single river name of Etruscan etymology. Sixth point, Rhetian pre-Roman place names are all Pre, uh, are all uh, pre-Roman region place names are all of Indo-European etymology. I don't know uh, Bisdato. Uh, I don't know uh, any place names, be it um, macro place names or micro place names of region etymology. And the seventh point is that at least four region inscriptions can be read as Celtic inscription. Uh, a well-known case is the Faten Stili um, from Tomarki on, but there are three more inscriptions from uh, Ganglek and Tealan and uh, Moritzing that can be read as Celtic inscription as well. And moreover, the Steinberg uh, first three inscriptions can be read as Indo-European inscriptions through di uh, Celtic diachronic phonology. So the picture is eighth point that the Alpine region was thoroughly inhabited by Proto-Indo-European speaking peoples. So the Proto-Indo-European language was spoken in the Alpine region. That would, um, by the way, explain also why in southern Italy and Sicily, for instance, we don't find uh, step ancestry, but Indo-European uh, languages in, instead, because this layer, this place name layer, extends from the British Isles uh, to the Anatolia Peninsula, Anatolian Peninsula. It's uh, not limited to the Celtic region, nor uh, um, more or less so to the Alpine region. And the conclusion is that um, Ticinian languages are later than Indo-European languages in the Alpine region and generally in uh, Central and Western and Southern Europe as well. Thank you. So we have a different point of view that we missed so far. Also, the, 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 the position of the, of the high ancestry of the Proto-Indo-European, possibly connected all, already to the Neolithic, uh, uh, let's say, um, movement uh, uh, connected to the um, uh, expansion of the productive economy in, in the Mediterranean. I think we have to stop before having a lot of discussion. I saw that Simona was not in agreement with some of the readings of the of the of the um, um, documents as uh, 
Indo-European or Celtic ones uh, that could possibly, in uh, the view of Guido Borghi, be read as, uh, 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 let's say, um, also Indo-Celtic uh, ones. I, I would uh, stop a, li a little moment. Um, and uh, uh, we uh, can see then there is a comment by Gus Cronen, but I would stop a little bit the discussion not to have too much fire and ask uh, if Luca Zagetti is willing to say something about religion and ritual, because we didn't speak at all about this arg these arguments uh, and we are approaching the end of our discussion. Thank you. Uh, I prefer uh, you continue the discussion. <laughs> no, no, it's very interesting. Yes, but I, I think that this uh, last uh, intervention made uh, a lot of, uh, um, brought a lot of arguments. Uh, for instance, there are two comments. One is by Christian that said, if Belbica, as Belbica people was in the Alpine region, this can explain the Proto-Indo-European. And this is a possibility indeed. And uh, Gus Cronen wrote instead, if the linguistic experts are right, that the split between Rekiti and the Etruscan is more basal, than the Etruscan and Lemnian, that would point to an Italic homeland for Tyrrhenian and the uh, out migration to Lemnos with a single movement, not a double one. I guess you're right, this would mean that Lem Lemnos should look like early Iron Age Etruscans with relatively little Anatolian ancestry. And again, I guess, uh, if I can add, the position is that uh, we could have some elite movement uh, or some specific movement of some people to Lem Lemnos and not a whole migration for the a, a big colony. So far, we don't have evidence of a whole colony. As uh, Kiai show, has shown us, uh, we only have uh, uh, Greek Anatolian uh, archaeological materials and nothing coming from, from the West. So this is another inter interesting point. I don't know if there is anybody else wishing to speak now. Maybe Simona wanted to answer a little bit. Well, I, I see that it is 436. Yes, but we, we started at 4. And probably some of the, of the guests, of the attendant uh, would like to leave. I don't know. Uh, we can also close the, um, the, the, the Facebook streaming. And uh, the persons who want to remain to discuss are free to, to remain. We still hear so some, some time more. And um, well, Simone, if you if you let me.